Coast. No water. And uh, at, at first sight, to me at least, from where I live, this seems to be uh, not understandable because Brazil is one of the countries that get most rainfall. So, why is this? And, and one thing I want to say that I don't think has been said, but that should be said, uh, Sao Paulo has grown unsustainably large. So this is, I looked up the population uh, size of Sao Paulo. That's only the city itself, not all the cities around it. In 1940, it was only a little over a million people living here. 2010, more than 10 times as big. And uh, these are two satellite pictures, one from 1986 and one from 2013. So you can really see how Sao Paulo has spread even in these spring years. Uh, and this would not be such a problem if there was a huge river uh, that would feed some power. But this is obviously the map of South America. And uh, I'm overlaying uh, the, the natural watersheds. And uh, well, here, here, and uh, the watersheds that are very much richer, as was pointed out out here in the Amazon basin. But the fact is that no big rivers drain this way. Uh, and then the front overlay is a drought risk map. Um, well, the drought risk is actually uh, not that severe around here, it's much more severe here, uh, but it's magnified by the population. So if you, uh, if you just plot for the different states of Brazil water resources per person, uh, then you see that we're looking really bad here and really good up there. So I think this just uh, pointed out the network of, um, of reservoirs, and, and this is a picture that I uh, took of Wikipedia where you can see how the reservoirs have been declining even with the uh, introduction of deeper prices that is not long term sustainable. So, uh, this is sort of my introduction. I, I want to uh, talk about long-term problems with water that have to do with global warming. And so, um, let's start with the atmosphere. The atmosphere, this is the composition. It's 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 1% argon, and 400 ppm carbon dioxide. So, Two years ago, we first crossed this 400 ppm threshold, and next year we will never go below it again. The total mass of the atmosphere is 5 times 10 to 18 kilograms, and each one of those 1 ppm from uh, carbon dioxide weighs 8 billion tons. So historically, this is a, a picture from uh, our textbook. Uh, these are the last uh, half million years or so. Historically, uh, the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere has fluctuated between a low of about 190 parts per million and up to 300. So then when you magnify in the last uh, thousand years, uh, this sometimes is called the hockey stick. Hockey is not a very popular sport. In Brazil, but uh, it's played by people running on skates or on ice, and they have sticks in their hands, and they have bent in the, in the bottom like this. So this is called the hockey stick graph because it, it's horizontal for the better part of the last thousand years, and then with the beginning of the industrial revolution, this has shot up like this. And if we're just magnifying the last thousand or fifteen years, uh, there is. Uh, Two sets of measurements that I just here. One is the air over the South Pole, and then this is the air in Hawaii. And what you can see is that there are annual fluctuations up and down, and in Hawaii they correspond to about seven parts per million, which is uh, plants growing and absorbing carbon dioxide, and then in the winter dying and releasing the carbon dioxide. And you can see that in the northern and the southern hemisphere, because of these wind currents that were just mentioned, 
uh, the northern and the southern hemisphere don't mix a lot. And, um, and so carbon dioxide by and large is not transported across in large enough quantities to counteract the seasonal effects. Of course, when it's winter here, it's somewhere in the northern hemisphere, and that's why these two oscillations uh, are opposite in direction. And most of the plant mass is in the northern hemisphere, and that's why the northern hemisphere oscillations are big. The biggest problem in this graph is not these oscillations, their nature, and their, it's good that they're there, but that they have a steady rise of about two parts per million, which means uh, 60 billion tons of carbon dioxide get added every year to the atmosphere. And with it, the global temperature is rising. And so when we talk about the global temperature, obviously you have to average over the entire year, but also over the entire globe. And then um, different, different averaging procedures have been uh, applied, uh, sometimes necessitated by uh, measurement stations not having been in place for uh, a long time. Sometimes necessitated by uh, different concentrations. For example, you can, you can weigh the land area different than the sea area. Um, okay. So this, by the way, is a satellite picture uh, from June 1992 of the global average temperature that one month. Uh, what you can see is when you do the averaging over the entire uh, globe uh, in any given year, is there is a tendency that has been going on for the last century where this temperature slowly rises. Uh, currently the best estimate is about two tenths of a degree Celsius per decade. Uh, for a few years it seemed like um, this tendency had saturated up here but uh, this is not on this plot but the last year uh, was the hottest on the record. Uh, now the effect of a, a higher temperature is that more water can be in the atmosphere. So this would actually be good for drought prevention, right? Uh, so what I've got here is, uh, well, well first of all, the current average of water uh, content in the atmosphere is one quarter of one percent worldwide average. Uh, this, uh, I just said that the atmosphere weighs five times 10 to the 18 kilograms, so this is roughly 10 to the 16 kilograms of water that are in the air at any given time. If the temperature of the globe rises, that means that the atmosphere can hold more water and there's more precipitation on average. Uh, I showed this year where I plot the dew point temperature as a function of the uh, air temperature and as a function of relative humidity. And, and basically, any point under this tent is a possible condition of the atmosphere. So, obviously, if you raise the temperature and then make the tent higher, you can store more water in the atmosphere. Uh, this is a, an interesting. Uh, satellite will be from NASA's Earth Observatory and uh, what, uh, what I will show here is starting in July 2002, month by month until now, uh, on this side what the uh, amount of water vapor is in the air and what the total rainfall is. So here the yellow means very little water vapor as was just pointed out in the Sahara there's almost no uh, moisture, and blue means high water vapor content, like here over the Amazonian. And then uh, this is measured for the rainfall. This is also just pointed out very dry here and here, uh, from almost no rainfall to 2,000 millimeters. And uh, just to give us a scale, the equivalent water depth of our atmosphere is 10 meters. So 0.25% uh, water in the atmosphere means about an average of 2.5 centimeter water vapor column. This goes from 0 to 6, that sets the scale. As far as the rainfall is concerned, the, the rule of thumb that I always use is that the global annual precipitation, rain and snow, add up to about 1 meter, about this high. Uh, 
uh, so uh, one meter is a thousand millimeters, so this is one thousand liters per square meter. Thousand millimeter, uh, what this logarithmic scale is about here. Okay, so um, what I find more interesting to, uh, to plot is the end of snowfall. Uh, and so what I've done here in this uh, map, I also use these uh, Earth Observatory data and projected absurdity in three different views. This is North America Center, this is South America Center, and this is Eurasia Center. And, and these are the actual colors of the Earth. Uh, not some kind of enhanced, but with the cloud, cloud subtracted. So this Earth Observatory satellite goes over and over, and they just take picture after picture, and then they have an option how we uh, picture that they use that. And so this is the superposition of all of them. Uh, for the entire year 2013, so when I started this January, February, March, it's almost going go around here. And what you would see is, uh, in January is our winter in, in North America. This is where I live. Basically, my entire state is covered with snow for the entire month of January. In Canada, of course, the entire country of Canada is covered. Down here, there's almost no snow in January. Russia is covered by snow. So I let this run. And so you can see uh, that the snow re retreats uh, in the northern hemisphere summer months, August and so on, and then goes down again. Um, and it should have looped, but it does not. And here in South America, you can see that the Europe winter might soar around the Andes and get snow covered. But this is actually the weak effect that we had last year. Um, and so uh, let me show you uh, how this looked uh, since 2000. So this is the snow cover in this uh, world wider projection. Um, and, uh, and here's the fraction of snow cover for each of these pixels. This goes a lot faster, tenths of a second per month, because I have to wait so long for 2002, and we loop all the way to 2015. You can see how the northern hemisphere gets covered again and again. There are uncovered parts. This is an artifact because of satellite kept the coverage. Uh, and down here you can see the snow cover in the Andes very. So this angle up and down of the snow cover in the northern hemisphere is really, really important for the overall albedo of the planet, the, the amount of sun that the planet gets reflect. If the snow cover gets reduced significantly a few years in a row, then it becomes a self-accelerating aspect. Uh, like the previous speaker just talked about the radiation balance of the atmosphere, and that is drastically changed if there's snow on the ground and no snow on the ground. But for the purpose of this region, I try to concentrate um, on just the August snow cover. So I only looked at the thickest of the winter months and played that movie. Uh, so only those slides that, this, that are August, I let each one sit there for two seconds. And I want to see if there is a discernible change in the snow cover in the Andes in the last 15 years. And I have to say, the signal is not very clear. Uh, it seemed to be a, a period of enhanced snow cover in 2003 to 2005, uh, but over the last few years it has been properly uh, said. I thought I had a 2013, but I not. Um, so this is uh, the land surface temperature anomaly uh, that was previously mentioned compared to the annual snowfall. Uh, and again, it's really hard to see any clear signal what's happening. The tendencies in global warming are just, um, they are there, but, but very weak over time. After all, the global temperature rise is only two tenths of a degree uh, per decade. Well, nevertheless, uh, there are big effects. So uh, you're not the only place that has droughts. Uh, this is a picture that just was in the Los Angeles Times. Uh, 
uh, one of the reservoirs, the Lake Oroville Reservoir, and you can see uh, that this is normally full, and so there are 50 meters down from their peak level in that reservoir. Perhaps even more impressive is this picture, because this Folsom Lake is also a reservoir, usually it's used for boating, so these are boat docks. And the, you know, the, the lake has receded to a very, very small fraction of what it was, and 600 boat docks are just lying here and cannot be used anymore. Um, so here there is a clear signal relative to the snow cover. So this is a satellite picture of just California, and you see the Central Valley and the Sierra Nevada Mountains and the rest of the Rockies is further out. Uh, and this picture was taken in just this year, uh, two months ago, January 2015, and there's a little bit of snow cover here. Uh, this is a, from January 2013, and you can really see the difference. Now, the winter in 2014 was the hottest in the history of California. Uh, so last year the winter temperature across the state was 7.6 degrees Celsius. That's the average in winter, even up on the mountains. Uh, this year's winter temperature has gone up another degree. So if you think you're in trouble, they're in much bigger trouble. Uh, so these are uh, drought protection projections projected uh, forward. All these models, of course, are developed by comparing historical data, fine-tuning the parameters, and then calculating forward to see what will happen. And uh, these are two regions, uh, the southwest, which is this region, and then the central plains, which is uh, this region. And uh, basically, you see that starting now, they bring bigger and bigger and bigger uh, water deficits in the south and west of the United States. And so uh, these are now likelihood projection, projections that there would be decades of droughts and multi-decade long droughts. Uh, and there are three climate models that I show here, red, green, and blue. And so in the central plain states, uh, this is the 1950 to 2000 interval. And this is the 2050 to 2100 interval projected forward. And you can see that the probability for a decades long crowd is basically twice as high uh, in the central plains. And while there was almost uh, no probability for a multi decade long drought period, that seems to be the new norm at the end of the century for the central plains. In the southwest, same picture. Of course, then what people do is uh, they tap into the groundwater. So this is a, a picture of the main aquifers in the United States. Uh, this aquifer is under the Central Valley in California. And since farmers don't get enough precipitation and not enough allotment from uh, the rivers, and the, aqu the aqueducts, they drill deeper and deeper into the aquifers. This is another interesting one in the central plains that's called the Ogallala Aquifer. And, and the reason why this is so important is because it's used for farming irrigation, but it's also under uh, danger from uh, fracking for natural gas. Uh, so this is in the central level, uh, in the central valley in California, uh, starting in 1962, uh, the change the groundwater level and you know in blue there are the red periods with high precipitation and in white the dry ones low precipitation that's also due to El Nino and in El Nino as was just pointed out but you can see that in the dry periods the groundwater level falls a lot faster than it rises in the wet periods and so overall the groundwater has fallen and fallen and actually uh, this NASA Gray satellite can make very, very sensitive measurements uh, of, um, of the altitude below it. And they have actually found that the Central Valley in California, due to pumping out of the groundwater under it, has fallen uh, in the last decade by 30 centimeters. 
and of course, uh, in the US, this is uh, probably the main vegetable growing region, the Central Valley in California. So 99% of the artichokes, 99% of the almonds, 98% of the garlic, uh, tomatoes, all the strawberries, all of this comes from this region uh, in the US. So this is a big problem, not just for California, but the US. Um, a different version of, of this graph was just shown in the previous presentation. It, it, it says how far below ground are the groundwater resources that you can tap into with your wells. And obviously here uh, in the Amazon basin, uh, you know, you just basically step really hard on the ground and your feet get wet because the groundwater is right below the soil. Uh, here it's quite a bit different. This scale is 300 meters, this is 600 meters. So you have to drill quite a bit. Okay, I'm uh, pretty much exceeded my time, but I wanted to uh, cover a few other uh, intersection points between um, water and energy. And uh, they are. Uh, well, we have renewable fuels that we can that we can uh, make our plants. So here in uh, in Brazil, this is mainly for sugarcane. Professor Goldberg was at some point was supposed to be here, but uh, I'm not sure he's still on the program. Uh, he and I had this discussion before. You really need water to make this an economically viable proposition. Uh, in the U.S., we don't grow sugarcane; we grow corn to make biofuels. In particular, bioethanol, which is not a good end product out of corn. I, I pointed that out last year here. Uh, what makes it worse is so, this is a precipitation map of the United States, and you can see this side of the country is much wetter than this side of the country. Um, and so, while it makes sense to grow corn in this area, it really doesn't make sense to grow corn here. Uh, because you need so much water from artificial irrigation. And this is exactly where the main corn growing states in the US are. So plants need water, uh, and if you want to uh, produce renewable energy out of plants, you have to be careful that you have actually enough natural rainfall, because otherwise you're inducing a very unwanted correlation. Of course, you can also use energy to turn that into water, and that's something that this region may need to consider, and that is desalination. Uh, and so uh, I just studied how much energy does it take uh, to take the salt out of salt water. And the best plants to do this are reverse osmosis plants. There's also plants where you heat the water uh, and basically uh, distill it but that's really only useful in, in areas where you can then use the warm water to heat your buildings too. And that really doesn't work for you. So for this area, only desalination uh, is a viable technique. And then the most efficient uh, of these plants spend about 5 kilowatt hours per cubic meter of water. So 1,000 liter, and it costs you about uh, one and a half or two reais to make 1,000 liters of water. So that's that's a very workable proposition from an energy money standpoint. Worldwide, uh, there are more than 15,000 desalination plants, and each well, I don't know how many overall desalination plants are. I just looked up the numbers for large desalination plants, which make about 1,000 cubic meters per hour or more. And so 15,000 of these are already there. This is an example from Barcelona in Spain, for example. So this is a very workable uh, technology that people may want to consider much more later. Um, I, I already touched on this. Um, so, so what I've shown here is uh, hydraulic fracturing, fracking. What, what's done there is you drill wells uh, into the ground, um, one, two, three kilometers deep, and then you force 
a mixture of water and some chemicals and also fine sand down these wells to fracture the rock. Uh, and then you have other boreholes through which you let uh, whatever you have uh, released up there escape up and you hope that it's mainly methane. And, and this works actually amazingly well and over the last maybe five years in the U.S. the energy landscape has totally changed. Uh, the U.S. is now a net exporter of energy because of the abundant resources of natural gas that have been uh, released through hydraulic fracture. And um, so this is an overall picture, uh, county by county, how many uh, wells uh, there are. And, uh, you know, uh, there are about 40,000 or so of these. Uh, uh, there are these little black dots that you can see here. And, and the major areas are this Marcellus uh, and Utica shade here. And then you can see North Dakota and even drawn into the Plain States, and in particular Texas, all these wells. And what's overlaid then uh, is the water stress that exists in these areas. So low stress are the yellow areas. And then it goes to dark red, or is extremely uh, high stress. Um, and you can see that a lot of this fracturing, again, is in very high stress water areas. And that is, and here too, that is a problem. In the US currently, about 150 billion, so that's 150,000 million liters. Um, of water are used for fracking and lost in the process uh, each year. So, so this, uh, this is a very large problem, in particular in the West. Here, uh, these areas are the Great Lakes in black. And of course, I, I live here in Michigan, in the middle of these Great Lakes. If we have one thing, we have water. All right, so uh, water and energy, this is my summary. Uh, there's a strong conflict between the two. So water is needed for energy production uh, in fracking, I, I just talked about, in biofuels. Uh, but also if you want to do um, uh, burning of fossil fuels and driving a turbine that also involves uh, heating water, and letting the water vapor become steam and, and driving a turbine. And in most of these power plants, huge amounts of water are needed. Uh, energy can be used to gain water resources. And, and I'm just, I haven't talked about this, but simple pumping is a possibility. When people talk about, for example, the Keystone XL pipeline, basically from Canada all the way to the United States into the Gulf of Mexico, pump you huge amounts of oil, that is an economically viable proposition. You can think in the same way about water. Uh, and so I just raise this as a question. I'm not sure that I want to recommend this. It's probably a nonsensical idea, but at least somebody should think about it. Um, and desalination, I think, has a lower price point than this idea because it costs energy to move forward. Uh, where I spent most of my time on this is indirect coupling between water and energy to global warming. We cause global warming by burning fossil fuels and adding CO2 to the atmosphere, therefore raising the overall temperature of the atmosphere, uh, which this warming of the Earth then reduces the snowpack, and when the snowpack is reduced, you destroy the ability in many parts of the earth. I, I talked about California and the Rockies, but this is an even bigger problem in the Himalayas and the large streams in China and Southeast Asia that that are fed by melting water. So when you when you destroy the snowpack, uh, you know water emergencies in the regions that depend on that melting water are an unavoidable consequence. So thank you for your attention.